And this meeting is being recorded. Oh, cool. <laughs> All right, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is one of our Lissa chat and chills with Emily Jabrinski is here to join us tonight. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily Drabinski, and I am uh, an academic librarian in New York City. I work at CUNY, and I adjunct at Rutgers most semesters. I'm taking this semester off to run for president of the American Library Association, which has been an adventure and more work than a class, Joyce, although <laughs> um, a lot of it feels kind of similar. Getting together, talking with people, making connections, make two ideas and stuff like that. So excited to be here tonight. We're so excited to have you with us. Um, so just to start off, i um, going to give you a, an easy one just for the students who maybe don't know you as well. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people um, might have taken a class with you or worked with you, but um, just we're interested in, the, you know, how did you get started in librarianship? Um, what kind of brought you into the field? Sure, yeah. I mean, I grew up in Boise, Idaho, and I went to college in New York City, which was like the big city, and I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. I wanted to write for magazines. Um, so I graduated from college and worked as a fact checker uh, at a bunch of different magazines. I started at Out Magazine um, and moved around to TV Guide and Entertainment Weekly, and I ended my fact checking life at Lucky Magazine, which is a magazine about shopping. Does anybody remember Lucky? Yeah, so I worked on the launch. It was amazing. I thought this, no way this catalog can go anywhere, right? Like who would pay money to read a catalog? But it turns out a lot of people would. The magazine really took off and I spent my days checking the prices of bags and shoes for the magazine. And I printed the number for Saks Fifth Avenue on a, on a spread about Barney's New York. And it was like, you would have thought I had caused the sinking of the Titanic. It was such an <laughs> epic mistake and people were crushed and it had huge implications and I had sleepless nights. And I was like, I don't wanna do this with my life. Like that is ridiculous. Like I don't care about shoes and bags. Like I have, you know, one pair of sensible shoes. So I meant, meant to work in a library instead. So I, I interviewed for a job at New York Public Library and I got it. And I was in their trainee program and they paid for part of library school. And I went to Syracuse and I did an online program like a lot of you were doing. And I, they had at that time, you would go up for a weekend like boot camp to start the program. And uh, I sat in my first class and we talked about what libraries were as like this project of gathering the sum total of human knowledge, describing it, making it possible for people to read it and then preserving it forever. And I was like, my mind was totally blown. And from that point on, I was like, this is the field I wanna spend my life in. And I have, so I've been a librarian for about 20 years and uh, I don't see that changing in my future. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. So, you know, in those 20 years, what are some of the types of libraries you've worked in or the areas that you've explored? So I started in public libraries as, and it was a trainee program. So you did a little of everything, mm -hmm. children's services. I programmed the films. I ran a book club. I, um, you know, did all those things. Uh, then I, uh, as many New York City lesbians do, I tried moving to California with my girlfriend. We moved to San Francisco and I worked there as a legal, loosely legal filer. So every month they get, you get new, pages for the tax code and you, I'd go around to all the law firms and like take out the old pages and put in the new pages. Um, I'm not going to go through every single job, Heather, but yeah. <laughs> just like <laughs> that job that I moved, you know, and I couldn't get a job in San Francisco, which is crazy because I've been working since I was 14 and I always get a job. And so I was like, well, this is ridiculous. So I moved back to New York, got a job as an indexer. So I indexed for the uh, social science index, the big yellow books. Joyce, do you remember the big yellow books? Yeah, you did that too at Wilson? No. I indexed for University of Pennsylvania Press. I was a really good indexer. I indexed books. 
Oh, indexing books sounds very cool. I was indexing journal articles, which was less uh, exciting. Well, we had yeah. really big, like physical file things. I'll talk, we'll talk sometime. <laughs> we had, they asked me in the job interview if I could be quiet. And I was like, what? This job is wild. And so then I, I, I was like, yes, I can be very quiet. And um, you had a quota of 40 articles a day. You had to index and it was just a ridiculous job. And you either stayed for six months, which is how long I lasted, or you stayed for 60 years. Um, and so uh, then I got my first job in an academic library. And that is where I've spent the most of my career. And I'm very happy there. I worked at Sarah Lawrence College, which is a small liberal arts college in uh, Westchester County. And I worked there for four years. Uh, and then got a job at Long Island University, Brooklyn, a job I was excited about because it was a lot closer to my house, you know, like very practical considerations, but I show up at LIU and it turns out it's an, it's a union job. And that was the first time I really experienced the union difference. My salary went up $20,000, $20,000. And it's not like my job was any different, um, except it was different because I got a lot more vacation time. So, uh, hey, Nancy, it's so nice to see you. So I did uh, that. Uh, for 10 years and uh, now I'm at the Graduate Center at CUNY. Huh? I could clearly go on and on, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No, that's, that's great. I mean, I love hearing different people's trajectory and kind of the different places they've bounced around over the years. Mm -hmm. It's very inspiring, um, you know, as we're starting out. Yeah. But um, so I guess another kind of like, maybe, maybe not easy, but repetitive like an question. icebreaker question. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what inspired you to run for ALA president? So. Yeah. Right. Like what, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know? Um, I, I, I really think that now is the time post pandemic that we have a real opportunity to tell different kinds of stories about what our lives are gonna be. You know, like all of us had our lives like stopped or changed radically in some way that was intense. And for library workers, it was a really, it's been a very difficult two years and there are new problems every day. And being on the campaign trail means I'm talking to a million people and everybody I talk to, there's something really intense happening for them. Like I talked to someone yesterday who posted a photo of herself holding the book Gender Queer on Twitter and was placed on administrative leave and not in Texas, not in Georgia, but in New York state, one of the bluest states in the country, right? So this is a moment where we're like getting sort of attacked on all sides and I just what I see happening what I see is a real need for a professional association like ours to talk in explicit ways about the ways we can organize with each other to uh, fight back against some of the stuff that we're facing that we need the skills to build collective power right so like stronger mm -hmm. together it's really true but you have to get together and there are some techniques of getting together. Um, what I didn't talk about was in my last job at uh, LIU, I was involved in uh, the pretty heavily involved in the union and have been on strike and have been locked out by my employer and have learned more than I want to about how important it is to have thick connections to one another so that we can stand together and mobilize around attacks when they happen. And so, um, I think I, I think our professional association can do that kind of work. It can keep, give us all, because I think, I don't know, and I'd be interested in hearing from the room, but how many of you have a sense of optimism and hope about the future? I mean, it's like hard to capture that like for a minute, you know, mm -hmm. but I think if you, if you are working deliberately and intentionally with other people to sort of build power together, the world feels better. And I think we could use that right now. And I was like, oh, let me just give it a try. So I'm giving it a try. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, and I want to take this opportunity to also kind of open the floor to everyone. Like this is a, a chat and chill. So yeah. if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, unmute and jump in and ask. Um, so just kind of wanted to put the open invite out there for everybody. Um, but I think, I mean, 
I mean, you're seeing this stuff in New Jersey also, Joyce? Yeah. Heavily. Yes. Um, yeah. Last well, Tuesday night, I invited Martha Hickson, who is my hero, um, who is the librarian at North Hunterton, who was attacked at a board meeting for being a pornographer, for having genderqueer and lawn boy in her collection. The kids rose up <laughs> at, 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 at board meetings that were um, after, after the one that in which she was attacked. Um, and what was amazing, and it's, it's incredibly transparent because she's got the, the group that she's with has mm -hmm. this amazing website where everything is out there, including the student testimonies and um, all the resources that she's gathered and, and a, a school board score sheet. So she's got all these resources. It's not just she who has created this, but you can see the way the board members have voted on these issues because she's holding the, that group is holding them accountable for their votes, including mm -hmm. their abstentions. Um, but since then, it moved from North Hunterton to Hunterton Central. And so um, the fact is, this is getting, um, it is so well organized. It is mm -hmm. so professional. It yeah. is, these are national groups. I've got, a, I've been curating a wakelet on this. Um, but know that ALA as well is organizing and developing oh, yeah. coalitions. And Tracy Hall has been organizing a rapid response team. And so um, I, I hope, you know, the world is so crazy right now that I thought this was the most important thing in the universe until two weeks ago. And now I'm like just. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even know where to position this in, in, in the moments, in this moment of time. And yet, yeah. and yet, um, you know, you see the, these, these position statements from the library, the Ukrainian Library Association, and we, we matter in so many different ways, mm -hmm. right? Nancy, I, know, I see Nancy shaking her head. Um, we're standing up for information, for access to information across the world. Um, and and this is this is all part of a larger whole and and and, and larger core beliefs, and um, I I don't know where I'm going with this, but I have just I, I don't think I've seen situations like this in my 45 year career as a librarian ever, and I don't think I've been I've seen this kind of amazing response that has not yet really emerged as powerful beyond um, the, the, the groups that, that um, we're seeing. And, and the other thing I wanna say is like, I have always loved parent groups as a school librarian mm -hmm. and as public librarian, parent groups have been like my allies in everything. And all of a sudden the parent groups that are emerging are like, how can I not love parent groups? And yet we're not seeing the full spectrum of parent groups yet. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing is the voices of students who have needed books that told their lived stories. Um, they're speaking up for that. They're speaking up for how to, they're demonstrating how to be active as citizens in a democracy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and basically what we're seeing is librarians who taught them not only that these books matter, but how to speak and how, mm -hmm. to, how to craft an argument and how to research that argument. And uh, you know, at the same point that I am frustrated and angry and, and I don't know what to do, I'm also proud that there is a resistance emerging. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I do oh, think there's something we're... slight, sorry, no, sorry, go ahead, Nancy. No, I was gonna say while we're on the topic since I'm teaching intellectual freedom as we speak, mm -hmm. one of my students wrote me today about how, how can we help with Ukraine? And I sent her both what ALA put out, but Library Journal has that wonderful site with all kinds of um, responses. And she wrote back and she said, well, these words are exactly what we're learning in intellectual freedom class. I mean, <laughs> so for them to see how relevant it is yeah. and how important these values are, but one other quick thing. So I'm the co-chair of the U.S.-Russia Library Dialogue. Uh, yeah, dialogue. I've been wondering, I've been wondering yes. how that's going. So I'm wondering too. Well, we've yeah. been in touch with our colleagues and, and uh, it, uh, 
at very awkward times, I have asked them how they felt about Putin in the past. Um, mm -hmm. This was a couple of years ago when we were still traveling to Russia. And, you know, he put them back on the map. So he's a hero to them, even educated people. But mm -hmm. when we, when my colleague spoke to our key person um, earlier this week, um, they, the Russian Library Association is trying to put out a statement. But this is another interesting piece because it's the full circle. He has COVID. When, and Sveta, Svetlana, the woman who we do most of our work coordination with, and we've worked with for more than 20 years from Russia, she had it so bad in the fall, she was hospitalized. They, they have a vaccine that's not very effective. And effective, less than yeah. half of the Russians have been vaccinated, but they have a, a Russian created vaccine that's not very effective. So, I mean, I could go on and on, but just a little bit to talk about. But one of the things, <laughs> this is president to potential president speaking, is I like to um, tell people when I tell them about all my travels around the world, I say, become a librarian and see the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And that we are citizens of librarianship across the mm -hmm. world. It is so exciting to work with people from, I mean, I'm always amazed. My Russian colleagues have as much in common with me as I have with my American colleagues. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. and, and I've worked all around the world and, and that's the case. So what we're talking about is so universal. It's not just something that you do in your own community. It's something that resonates worldwide. And that's something to really be excited about. And mm -hmm. when you're ALA president, you have such a bully pulpit. I know, I really, I really think it's the time to have a progressive in that spot, but we'll see what happens. Anyway, other questions from the from the students in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of have a question. It's more of like a thought, <laughs> but it's yeah, kind of a it, question Kayla. at the same time. It's a chat and chill. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it has to do with like uh, the queer aspects of librarianship. Mm -hmm. So I'm focusing a lot of my studies on kind of bridging the gap that I see between the LGBTQ plus community and the library community because mm -hmm. I work in a public library and there's absolutely like the most minimal amount of queer resources you could think of yeah it's very very minimal and even the more higher budgeted public libraries in like my residential area that I live in they still don't have like centralized mm -hmm. collections for like queer groups or anything like that so do you have any I, that's kind of like my thought but like the question is yeah like in regards to ALA do you think that there's anything like specifically they can do to kind of like push more of like an LGBTQ plus like friendly agenda within all library spaces yeah you know I I like the legacy of queers in ALA I find really inspiring like the rainbow round table the sort of do you know that history at all Kayla there was like, Very minimal. A, um, they did like a kiss in, you know, to try to get attention for gay, gay and lesbian issues inside the association. It's like really fantastic and really um, so cool. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's a, like, there's a loud, proud history and there's a, the current rainbow round table does a lot of great, great work also. And uh, some of my favorite campaign colleagues in this moment are, are members of that round table and part of that community. And so I think but like, I'd be interested in understanding a little bit more about like what the problem was there. Like, is the problem that the library is using um, subscription plans where it's not doing a kind of targeted selection to create those kinds of special collections? Is the problem that no one is the doing that? Is yeah, the problem is there's no like centralized collections. There's no like advancement within digital collections. Like okay. even on these library web pages, there's no like within their digital resources page, there's no like LGBT link or anything like that. Like I know the Free Public Library of like Philadelphia has one on all of their yeah. like standard web pages, stuff like that. So I just could could I you wonder make if one there's Kayla? like a <laughs> I'm 
kind of making one a little bit. <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> I mean, at the end uh, of the day, Dr. like Dr. Valenza's he's... class, I'm making a lib guide for queer resources. So it's kind of what Fantastic. I'm doing right now. <laughs> cool. Yeah. But then this is where I think like there's a, there's something a little diff, there's like a different valence when we talk about like organizing instead of in, as, a, as a not opposed to advocacy, but a slightly different thing. So organizing skills are about how do I get a thing? How do I compel the person in power to do the thing that I want them to do? So there's probably some librarian that you would have to convince to put your link on the web page, right? Yeah. And so how do I get that done? How do I get so many people in the library to be excited about my link being on the website and my curated collection that the person in charge has to say yes because otherwise it'd be saying no to all of us. So when I talk mm -hmm. about like building collective power, that's what you're doing. And so there are like ways to do that. We would make a list of everybody who worked in your library. We would have a clear demand you know, you're gonna, we're gonna make a special collection inside the library and we're gonna do a digital version for LGBTQ community resources. That's our demand. We'd make a list of everybody in the library. We'd assess them. People on the one side wanna get that done. People on the five side think gay people should not exist, right? They probably have, everybody's like in the in-between on that probably in your, in your unit, we would call it in the union. And we would figure out who those people were and how many people do we need to agree with Kayla so that we have a super majority and you, they can't say no to you anymore. So like that's having organizing conversations, it's making lists, it's assessing lists relative to demands, it's planning campaigns, it's all of the things that I think the right is doing really effectively right now in terms of the book challenges. And I think like that's something that you could do. And like, it's exciting to think about being able to do that without having to like wait for a policy statement, right? Because I think that's not, because a policy statement doesn't isn't actionable, you know. Although it's helpful, right? Because like we want to make CUNY fine free. Like CUNY is the big university library system. It like serves two hundred seventy five thousand students. The vast majority of them are low income, working class people, and we're charging them library fines. It's ridiculous. It's totally unethical. And so it's very helpful to have like a resolution from ALA that says don't have fines in your library because then I can show that to the people in charge. But like getting the people in charge to agree with that is like a whole different project that I think we need to talk more about because otherwise you're like, oh, they'll never say yes to my curated collection, you know? Do I sound like I'm ranting, Kayla? <laughs> no, I like what you said. Thank you. I really appreciate it. No, and I like that yeah. you tacked on the stuff about the fines because that was another question I was going to ask too. It's, my library is fine free and I, I set up like a whole Google sheet or whatever for like asking different libraries if they would like to explore the options of being fine free. Right. So I, I didn't know if you were like for being fine free or not. I'm totally for being fine free. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm against regressive taxes, but like getting the chancellor to agree that we shouldn't have fines. It's like, that's well, the task at hand. That's the task. Cause like, it doesn't, you know, one of the things you learn in organizing too, is it doesn't matter if you're right. So like, it's correct. It's for me, the correct position in a library is to like not have fines, but that doesn't being right doesn't get me anywhere. <laughs> it's only it's about only other people supporting you being right. Yeah, it's about collective power. We all agree that we're right and we're gonna refuse to leave your office until you go find free. That's like at the end of the that's the last <laughs> thing we're gonna do. But that's gotta be on the table. Yeah. That's kind of interesting that Cooney is not fine free because didn't um New York Public Library go fine free about a year ago or so? New York public Queens and Brooklyn public, they all went fine free. They got huge amounts of publicity and CUNY is not fine free. And the board of trustees says no because they see it as a revenue source. So then we gathered all the information and like the total revenue from all CUNY libraries that we gathered in fines was like $40,000. And I'm like, I can give you 40, you know, like what, that's <laughs> no dollars for a place like CUNY. Yeah. And the goodwill that we would get from being fine free. I don't, I don't understand it. Yeah. Are you a New Yorker, Natalie? Are you no, here? I was born in New York, but I'm a New Jersey okay. resident. Okay. Yeah. Is Rutgers Library fine free? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Seeing a lot of head shaking now. <laughs> Nancy, you should know that, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Sherry. Um, so I, did, I had a question. I'm just sort of interested in your thoughts. Um, when I first, so for the people who don't know me, 
my name is Sherry Farber. I'm the I'm one of the liaisons to Sky, and I'm also the information literacy instruction librarian at Rutgers. Um, and I'm a recent graduate, so I have only gra I'm a new career librarian. Graduated in 2018, and when I graduated, I I had my first jobs that were part time jobs in in academic libraries, and I discovered this world of part time academic library workers, and mm -hmm. it was shocking to me. And it was shocking because it consisted of a lot of young women, and most of them had small children. And they were, they were really stressed out and they were racing from job to job with no benefits. They're also dealing with like picking up kids in between. Some of them, you know, would, would pick up some night work. I mean, it mm -hmm. was wild. And I think that part of it, you know, New Jersey is dense. So they had opportunities at different libraries. Some, you know, here they were at an academic library. Then they had night shift at a public library. And, and it just seems like when you talk about a living wage and, and our professional mm -hmm. practice and opportunity, it seems like a really bad, under, like an underclass and they, they don't oh, yeah. see a way out. And I, I, I just, it, I mean, it has to do with also, you know, it's pretty gendered, um, I think, and mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, pressure on, on, on especially young women um, to kind of deal with this. So yeah. I just you know your thoughts when you think about coll collective action or, because I think I only knew about that world because I- became, You were in that world. I yeah, and I, I would have liked to have known more about it and have pe more conversations with people who are kind of, you know, dealing with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I have this 13 year old, right? And I took him to the library, uh, New York Public Library to get a library card. And we go down to the teen room and I say to the YA librarian, youth librarian, I say, hey, my kid needs a library card, can you help me? And she looked at him and said, how old are you? And he said, 13. And she said, we'll take it from here. And she, I watched the way she cleaved me from my child and sort of inaugurated him into this world of public reading, right? Of public library life, his own independent intellectual world that he was gonna create, co-create with this library, with this librarian. And I was like, that is just magical. And what I want is for that librarian to do that and only that all day for my kid, for your kid, for all the kids that come in. And I, what I don't want her doing is like driving around and freaking out and worrying a lot about how she's gonna pay her rent. So we, those kinds of precarious contingent positions are really corrosive to what libraries do for their communities. People need to be secure at work so that they can do the job, right? Like as we, as we say in the union movement, students learning conditions are our working conditions. Like you learn better when I'm present in the classroom and teaching you. So it's a serious problem. Um, it's something, you know, there are unions in higher education working on it. Um, Rutgers has one, right? Like Rutgers has a great full-time faculty union. The part-time faculty union is right now trying to merge with the fa full-time faculty union to make a bigger uh, presence on campus. You know, that kind of stuff is really fantastic because you have those positions don't work for people and they don't work for institutions and they don't work for what we want libraries to do. So yeah, I don't, you know, I don't have like a quick answer but it's definitely a problem. And, you know, there are so many people working 19 hours. Like, I don't know if any of the students in the room have one of those jobs where it's like 19 hours and 55 minutes, so you're not benefited. And it's just, it should be illegal and it's not. So we need to, you know, be clear about what those working conditions are and, and, and fight against them, yeah. Yeah, bouncing off of this, especially with um, the, about um, a livable wage, especially is, uh, I've noticed that, I mean, I know ALA has their own and NJLA, they have their, guidelines and guidances on pay and different rates and I've seen like the document like library associate mm -hmm. one would make this library associate two would make this library one would make this but I mean I know there's nothing that you can really do about um making other institutions pay that but I've seen positions that ask for an MLIS and five years in that specific setting and are paying 15 an hour for 19 hours 19 and a half hours mm -hmm. and it's just kind of sad and especially even um with my position, I 
it was very nice of this uh, other this special collections librarian to reach out to me about a position because I was re really interested in doing kind of the hands on kind of work that I don't get in my position as remote. Um, mm -hmm. But the pay was just a lot less than what I'm making now my current position and they're both the same grade too. they're both student mm -hmm. worker positions. And the difference in pay is really what I told her, like, I'm really sorry. This is really interesting to me, but I just really can't, do can't. It. especially as a master's student. It's kind of mm -hmm. important to be making enough money to be able to survive. I yeah, I totally agree that your survival is like <laughs> crucial, you know, I think and I'd be interested, Nancy, in your thoughts on this. So, so ALA has a parallel organization, the Allied Professional Association, it just turned 20. It's supposed to be- I was the of, leader of forming it. I mean, I you, chaired the committee. So yes, you're reminding so me how old I am. Yeah. So what happened, Nancy? So this is, an, this is a part of the association that's supposed to do the kind of work that you're asking about, Natalie, and that you're asking about, Sherry, that's like taking a critical look at what's happening in the labor, in the workplace and trying to come up with strategies for combating that. So why has it not been more effective in doing that, Nancy? Do you have ideas? Well, let me start off by saying, why do we have it? Because why do we as have a 501, it? Yeah. we're a 501c3, we're a charitable organization, and we're not allowed to advocate on behalf of our members. So we had to create a C6 uh, organization, a different kind of organization that allowed us to do more advocacy and it also allowed us to certify Wait, Nancy, people 501 501c3 means you cannot that that means you cannot advocate on behalf of your members that's you one of the not advocate you you cannot advocate for their work conditions that's correct. interesting okay got it okay so so this all came up when i was just before I was president, when I was president, and then I chaired the committee to create the new organization. So to so the same is true with you can't certify workers. We accredit programs through the American Library Association, like the Rutgers program, but you can't certify workers. We also, a lot of the divisions wanted to do certificates, particularly the Public Library Association to certify public library directors and all kinds of other kinds of cert certificate programs. So we couldn't do that as a C3 either, even though a C3 is an educational organization, but you can't certify through a C3. So it's a very intricate legal and tax mm -hmm. stuff. So that's why we created it. But in created it, creating it, we can't pay it it has to receive its own income. It can pay us, but we can't pay it. This is another okay. technical problem of mm -hmm. C3s and C6s. And I, I could okay. go on and on, but you don't want to hear okay. it. So, so because we can't pay it, we have to ask for separate donations. And most people don't even know what it is. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, then when we established it, council, I was the one who had to get up in front of council and it was messy, let me tell you, trying to explain this to people. But council insisted that they wanted, we were just gonna have the executive board have an, a, a parallel right. executive board yeah. for it. Sure. No, nope, they wanted a council for it. So it has this very complex structure mm -hmm. because they insisted on it. So the ALA council then becomes the ALA APA council for one for a part of its meeting and the board has to do the same. So it's a very cumbersome structure. And financially, they haven't really been able to do the mm -hmm. kind of fundraising from our members that most of you I'm sure are not even aware that this exists or why it exists even, right? So right. it's complicated. And because it's 20 years now, you know, there's a lot of action. Um, Mitch Friedman was president mm -hmm. after two, two, two after me. And he mm -hmm. wanted to focus on librarians and advocating for the profession and mm -hmm. for workers. 
and we had to get it created in time for him okay. to have his presidential <laughs> program on the top. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yes. So, I got it passed. Good job, Five Nancy. minutes I'm before totally he impressed. returned from being on the Today Show on the Tuesday morning of that, that midwinter council. <laughs> it was in Philadelphia. I could tell you everything about it. And it was finally unanimous, but it was tough going. A tough go. Yeah. So I think like it's, a, it's an example of like a structure exists to sort of address the problem but figuring out how to work it so that it can be effective is part of the challenge. And it doesn't seem like there are the resources necessary. Bye Joyce, nice to see you. Like it doesn't have the resources that would be necessary to make it work in those ways, maybe. I don't know. Well, I think you're, so Mitch brought a lot of attention. Your presidency would bring a lot of attention and it Mm -hmm. could then get more momentum. Yeah. You know, everything in ALA peaks and ebbs. Sometimes, like with mm-hmm. intellectual freedom, it's from the outside, but it's often from the inside. That mm-hmm. and that's where the president has such a bully pulpit. Even though you don't really, you can't really do that much. Yeah. You have the power of the narrative. Yeah, this is the power of the narrative. Yeah, that I'm really interested in because I think I can tell a pretty good story. Anyway, Heather. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I was just thinking, I mean, kind of talking about all of these things and sort of, um, you know, these different coalitions and like getting momentum. And I guess as mm-hmm. students and people who are made, like, whether we're newer to the field or we're in the field, but kind of mm-hmm. trying to advance, um, I guess I'm wondering what your thoughts are on being more involved with ALA, um, being more involved in these like initiatives. Um, like, I don't know, maybe we're like when you were a student, were you in ALA, ALA? Like maybe like some of. Yeah, so when I was a library school student, it was 2001 and the Twin Towers had fallen and I watched ALA be like one of the only public institutions that took a stand against the Patriot Act. And it was so incredibly inspiring to me. I felt so proud to be a librarian, so proud to be a member of the American Library Association. It was like amazing. I had a good, it may give me a good feel like being a librarian meant that I was like doing this bold, brave thing. So I wasn't involved at all. It mostly was just like, I got my member card in the mail and that was like enough. I think it's a difficult association to crack. It has this sort of volunteer process where you put in your, you know, which committees you want to serve on and then you get picked or you don't. And I think there is like, there's some barriers to it. And I don't know, I'll, I'll just admit that a lot of the committee work I've done has been not inspiring. You know, I've gone to the committee and it feels like it exists to reproduce itself a little bit. Like it exists to sort of produce a, plan for the year that you submit to the board and it's like what are we doing here so I think that could be like a a barrier to to engagement um but I also think it you know it has a lot of resources it has people who can schedule meetings for you it has events that you can participate in and you know we could use those tools to do sort of stuff that was more interesting and more exciting you know I've been talking to like a zillion and one people and there are pockets of the association doing just extraordinary work. And it's been such a joy for me to get to learn about some of it. And, you know, so, you know, I would just chit chat with you, Heather, and see what you were interested in, see if I could find somebody in the association you could hang out with, you know, it's like, I don't know how you scale that, but like, it is about (laughs) making the connections with people that, that I think you get sort of meaningful work out of the association, you know? because you, you want to do something that's fun and also moves the needle yeah. on something that you care intimately about. Um, and there are lots of those things, I think. Lots of people and lots of like, this is an amazing field. I really love being a part of it. There are all kinds of cool stuff you could talk about. Yeah. So since we discussed your library school experience, what was your undergrad? And I love, because I came from a pretty weird major so I love hearing how librarians came into library school with whatever background they were from before what was your weird major evolutionary anthropology (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't even know what that is. That's so cool. <laughs> it's uh, anthropology. It's kind of biological anthropology with a little bit of primatology. Okay. So um, a little bit of primatology, yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, so but cool. I kind of took like a osteological bio arc kind of focus. So I did some archaeology stuff because it's like it's so weird. I have like la- like lab experience, but it's like kind of minimal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But then I also have like the research heavy um, aspect of it too. So I love hearing how yeah. all these different archivists, librarians, all came into their kind of. Oh, you were an anthropology major too. That's so cool. Oh, Nancy, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so yeah. I was a political, I was a political science major at Columbia University, and that is like the most one of the most conservative political science programs in the world. It like literally like countries send people to Columbia to learn how to sort of run a state, right? Like it was absurd. So I'm in this class called War, Peace, and Strategy, where the final exam, no joke, was. Uh, write a strategy for defeating uh, three power, a, a war against three powers, one being China and two other choose two marginal threats. And so like I typed up my answer to that. And then we all had to get a distribution requirement. And so there was a class called political anthropology. And I was like, it has the word politics in it. So I bet it'll count. So I show up at my political anthropology class and the professor is Michael Tausig. Does anybody know him or his work? No, I don't. Google it. He is like, just, I walk in and he's like, like a cartoon of an anthropology, of a cultural anthropology professor, you know, he like is wearing sandals and like, his I jeans are all messy. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about? And his, the classes turns out not, it turns out to be about masks and unmasking. And we read like Baudrillard and Foucault and all these like crate, like really like Deleuze. And I was just like, well, this is not, this is not how to fight a three front war. And it's way cooler. And it was very cool. So then I got really into all these anthropology classes. And then uh, I think anthropology and library science are like, it definitely like is. This, yeah, I was know? so surprised because like, I took um, human information so behavior and I was like, this all sounds exactly like what I've already done. <laughs> yeah. And so I, my research background is sort of the politics of knowledge organization and classification and cataloging work, which is like anthropology, you know, um, like how, do, how are we going to, how are we going to order things? What are we going to put together as like, and what's going to be different? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, think I, thought, I never really thought of anthropology as kind of classification cataloging that makes a lot of sense obviously because right like you're ordering things cataloging people <laughs> yeah you're putting everybody everything in a category yeah yeah so look at the scenes all of those fun guys <laughs> you clearly have like a whole language i would never understand <laughs> yeah like what so like i think like i've I've, t- I've toyed with like getting a phd at different moments in my life um got into rutgers doctoral program but couldn't afford to go uh but the, um, yeah, if I, if I wasn't doing LIS, I think I would go and get a PhD in anthropology. I think it's really- I've been yeah. toying with it too. Do it. <laughs> I'm here. Come to the graduate so center where I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I know Stony Brook has a very big um, paleoanth program. So that's kind of what my mm-hmm. program, I, my program was very paleoanthro. So, mm-hmm. um, and I was kind of more interested in historical anthro because frankly, there's more, there's a higher level of preservation um yeah but it, that's kind of a little more um language stuff that I would have to do and I don't really yeah. have that background yeah choices man they told us that I could do data analyst work not not um library or public health specialist actually hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here but I like all my friends are in PhD programs like mostly in Boston um so it's just kind of funny how I ended up here and they all ended up doing the exact same thing (laughs) Heather I see you unmuted yeah just you know prepping if I was going to jump in or not I'm just wondering if anyone else has questions or um yeah just want to ask Emily thoughts concerns (laughs) 
mm -hmm. was reading Nancy's like chat about like oh what did she say in the jobs. chat um when oh, yeah. you were finishing school there weren't any jobs so they told you to be librarians <laughs> or help special I also worked at the university library. My job in college was uh, weeding the card catalog because like a book gets discarded or lost or whatever, mm -hmm. weeded, and then you have to go pull out its author, subject, and uh, title tracings. And I spent one summer weeding the Columbia Library School card catalog. And I spent I like untold hours doing that. And then at the end of the summer, they decided they would just burn the whole thing. <laughs> and I do think that like many things you end up doing in libraries are like that, you know, where you're like, mm -hmm. do all of this work and then it ends up, you know, it's like, because I've also spent part of my career like doing a lot of work around CD-ROMs, you know, don't do that anymore. And then you just like get rid of the CD-ROMs. I was just in, in Idaho visiting family and I went to a library and they were, took a little tour and they had, um, they had just remodeled like a whole new redesigned library and they had built all of these shelves for CDs. And they were like, well, what are you? nobody can even play a CD anymore, you know? <laughs> so when people say libraries are like slow to change, I'm like, are you kidding? All we do is change, you know? All we do is new technology, you know? Columbia Law Library is a poli sci student. That must've been interesting. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Our chat seems to be slowing down. Should should I say something in closing, Heather? What do you think? Um, any other questions? Any other questions? I don't wanna cut it off too early, but um, Kayla, were there any other, I know we had that. Were there any other thoughts that you wanted to add um, from our did we ask Kellyanne's question? Um, oh, what's Kellyanne's oh, question? Well, we sort of touched on it earlier. Yeah, a little um, bit. But talking about like book challenges in schools and libraries, you know, obviously there's this there's a rise, and we were kind of chatting about this before. But I guess um, just more of your thoughts on you know why it's happening and what we can do to kind of. Yeah, it's really that. terrifying. Like hearing Joyce tell that story about her yeah. New Jersey colleague, like the language is exactly the same as I heard from my New York colleague last night. So the they're really organized mm -hmm. and they're giving everybody in their networks a taste of what it feels like to exercise power collectively and to get wins, you know? And like, we need to be producing those kinds of situations for our own for people sort of on who share our commitments and values I would say like I went to this organizing training once and uh they just had people go around the room and tell tell the story about the first time you felt collective power and this woman who worked at a Verizon call center told a story about how they had organized every single person in the call center they got everybody in and uh, the action was, we're not going to make or receive a call for two minutes, right? Didn't you just get a chill, right? So like everybody on the floor was silent for two minutes while the managers were like, what's going on? What's going on? And so like that feeling, and I've had it through union work, like I've had it where you feel like, oh, the world could be different and we could make it so. Like the right is giving everybody those opportunities to feel those feelings and they're getting wins they're getting books pulled off the shelf like I don't know if my friend's gonna lose her job single mom two young children she's gonna lose her job I don't know you know maybe right and that's like even if she keeps it like she had to experience this sheer terror right while the right just keeps rolling so I think we have to be as organized as they are because they are eating our lunch, you know? And like, I, I really, I think the sort of politics of coalition building and advocacy are really great and important, but they can, they can only be successful if you have organized direct action stuff happening down below. And so like, are we gonna do that with each other or not? Seems to be my sort of question. And I think if we don't, like what's the world look like, you know? 
it looks like it looks right now, which is like really sad and scary for a lot of us, you know? Mm -hmm. And I realize this sort of sound like I'm ranting or like I'm a bumper sticker or something, but I really believe I'm a true believer, you know, that like we're in some serious trouble and all we have is each other, but we're enough if we can get together, you know? So I'm going to put a link to my website in the chat and we meet every Thursday at, um, com. We meet every Thursday night at eight to talk about the campaign. Uh, we have a Slack if you want to join it. I can send you a sticker. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Another thing that happened to me today was a librarian at Texas A&M called on the phone, or she emailed and said, "Hey, do you have time for a little chat?" And they, Texas A&M, hired a consultant that came in, evaluated the institution, and said the library should be a service unit, not a scholarly unit. And we're gonna eliminate tenure for everybody in the library, which eliminates your protect the, your labor protections, right? And like you did all the work to get tenure and now your job is precarious and you could be fired uh, at will, right? So what are we gonna do about that? And she's not the only person experiencing that. It's like everywhere. And so uh, if you're organized, you can mobilize when these issues come up. So of course, ALA is doing a lot of work, but if you talk to like a lot of regular library workers like I've been doing for the last three months, they don't think ALA is doing something. And so if it is, it's not visible enough to the people who are on the ground experiencing the trauma of, of like being sued. Like you're, you're just like a woman who works in the library in your small town and you're getting sued by these organ, like these far right wing organized sort of actors and like what are you going to do that is so scary and people need to know they're not alone and yeah i think ayla could do more of that so that's why i'm running i don't know so what, what would like um your first move be as president to kind of work on that uh we're gonna roll out organizing trainings for everybody and we're gonna we're just, we're gonna do what I did, which was go to a bunch of cl classes where I learned how to do it. We're gonna talk to each other. Um, and there's gonna be somebody in that bully pulpit that Nancy was talking about saying exactly what I've said to you tonight, that like there are more of us than there are of them. And I believe in that, I believe in us. And like, I just think we, I wanna hear that from the people in charge, you know? Which would be you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So I did this podcast and I listened to it back and I was like, I, I can't believe that I get to be the person on the podcast. That's unreal. I just never thought in a million years that they'd give a Marxist the chance. So anyway, <laughs> are you talking about the my... seriously wrong podcast? Yeah. Did you listen to it, Kayla? I did listen to most of it. I'm a podcast person. <laughs> I was oh, okay. like, I will listen to this. It was I really good. I also I watched like, the, the Office Hours with Tim Heidecker. That was cool too. I couldn't believe I got on Tim Heidecker. That was the guy in, in yeah. on the campaign team got me on that. It was pretty cool. That is really I cool. I saw that and I was like, Tim Heidecker? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the duo yeah. I did not expect, but the duo that I will accept. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good though. Have you been enjoying yeah. doing different, um, like campaigning in that area, like doing podcasts and like different talk show YouTube video things? Totally. I love chatting. As you can probably tell, I love like, I don't know, you know, chit-chatting and talking to people. It's I really have fun. come to find that most librarians that I've met really love to talk about what they do, like genuinely, in the nicest way possible. Like they're so passionate about what they're doing mm -hmm. and the work that they're involved in, and they really want to spread the word and talk about it. And you are much, much of the same, cut of the same cloth. I love it. I think it's so yeah. cool. If we like, if, 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 if everybody went to the library more often better world you know better world yeah <laughs> i'm preaching that to the people that i'm around all the time the library, working in a public like, library i'm like come to the library guys like this is everything. amazing <laughs> you can you be go quiet to the and like do your homework <laughs> yeah there's like there's like a drinking fountain and you can check out a book if you want or you don't have to <laughs> completely non-coercive non-commercial space it's amazing you can take a nap yeah. <laughs> take a nap. You'll probably get hassled. <laughs> Plenty of librarians would hassle you if you were taking a nap. <laughs> anyway. Well, 
Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Emily. I know I'm feeling inspired to get a little more involved with things, organize good. a little bit. Good. Um, yeah, we're going to have a good time together. I'm really glad yeah. that you invited me and super happy to spend this time with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, check out, like Emily put her website and email in the chat. So, you know, save those. I can send them out later to um, people who joined if you don't get a chance to grab it. Um, so, yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Emily.